Camera speed. Do you want me to dab? My name is Tony Marchante, although no one's going to hear this. Mm -hmm. So we're here interviewing you, Daniel. And um, now, Greg, we had talked about doing a little bit of like our story together. Mm -hmm. Do you want me to kind of phrase you some parts of questions? Is that maybe the better idea since it's different from what I thought it was going to be? Okay. So, Daniel, you and I had um, started with a call into my restaurant to bring you on board as a, as a, um, export from the, the uh, court system. Can you tell us a little bit about how we came to connect and what, what started our journey together? When I was first released from my incarceration, um, I went to a halfway house, which meant that I had to, um, I lived at a, um, at a building um, with other inmates who had recently been um, released from incarceration as well. And um, part of the program is that you have to go out to society and find a job, which is not the easiest task for, um, for convicted felons or people who have been convicted of any sort of crime at all. Um, so once um, I simply just looked around and um, found Chef Tony's um, restaurant, and um, upon that I called Chef, and um, he told me to come in, and I remember when I first came to the restaurant, I came down, um, took the metro out to Bethesda and came out here and sat down with you. And um, once I did that, it, the conversation was just very natural. It was something that seemed like it was something that was destined. It was like destiny was finally, you know, taking its course and um, sat down. Um, I was very straightforth with, with you, um, you know, and uh, explained to you that I had just recently been um, released from being incarcerated. Um, told you some of my uh, some of my plans and um, some of the some of the goals that I had set for myself, um, and upon explaining that to you, um, you know I, I think that you, you know your your intuition uh, directed you to uh, to believe that you know I was somebody that you could put on your team to help you out at the restaurant and uh, you know the rest is told. Mm -hmm. So obviously from my side there's there was a lot of um, unknown a lot of risk, a little bit of risk on my part to bring somebody into the business, you know, um, what could you see uh, maybe talking to somebody else that might be in that same set of, set of scenario coming out or trying to get a job with, you know, a shaky past, mm -hmm. what could you tell them maybe to, um, to go into that interview and, and what's the best practices? I think it's about faith and putting faith into action and changing the mind frame, you know. What do you think it's about? Thoughts. Oh yeah, um, I think that once you decide that you know you want to change your life, it's about um, having belief and putting your faith into action. Um, being that um, for somebody that wants to change their life around and they have to make the tra transition back out into society, um, it's not the easiest task. Um, there's going to be a lot of hurdles that you have to overcome and. Um, a lot of people and their, their understanding about life and the way that they look at you, you have, to, you have to be able to deal with that. You know, there's no way to look around that because in, in a sense you've sort of tainted yourself and your reputation. You know, so um, a lot of people, once they have the understanding that you've just been released from being incarcerated, um, they automatically categorize you as, you know, a criminal or someone that's not to be trusted. And at the same time, you can't really blame them for that because you made the mistake. You know, that's when you just have to put your faith and you have to, you have to really put some strong actions forward, you know, and just let them know, um, you know, that, that, you, that you have changed. But I would say most importantly, though, is just with yourself, know that you've changed. And um, once, you've know, once you know that you've changed, everything will fall into place and the actions will just come out right or come out proper. So let's go back in history a little bit um, to talk a little bit more about some of the specifics about what got you on this path of trouble first and then maybe more about you know how you're coming out of it obviously so you you uh share with me that the first time you were incarcerated or, or arrested you were nine years old correct um well if you look at my my timeline of uh criminality 
Um, it did begin when I was nine years old. I would say one of the, um, the main issues growing up that sort of made me um, adopt a mentality of, uh, you know, um, getting into crime was uh, my issue of being adopted. Um, at a young age, it's, it was an issue that I wasn't able to really respond to and or understand. Um, I just knew that I was someone in this world that wasn't going to ever meet their real biological parents. Um, and um, some people won't, won't understand that. Some people, they won't understand that simply because they won't go through that. Um, but for me, it really made me adopt this uh, sort of negative belief system about myself that my, my purpose for being in this world was one that was to be negative. Um, you know, I wasn't able to really make a connection with, uh, most importantly, um, a father figure. And so it really made me have to look on my own at nine years old when you're, you're immature and you're really ignorant of the world. You don't really know what to choose. Um, so um, it started in school and I was getting in trouble at school, getting kicked out of schools. And when I was nine years old, I got, into, uh, I got arrested. Um, for a breaking and entering charge that um, involved two other girls in my neighborhood. Um, and I speak about this in, in my writings, uh, my book, which I plan to have pub published. Um, and um, I mean, when it, the way it turned out, the, the person's house that we broke into, he was a, uh, he was a rock collector and um, an older man whose life had sort of, uh, he felt was coming to an end. And uh, he felt very lonely and um, in some sort of odd way by having, uh, you know, an eight, nine, and ten-year-old break into his house was sort of brought some sort of excitement into his life. You know, he felt like, you know, hey, you know, somebody's coming to my life because nobody has been in my life. Um, unfortunately, the way things turned out uh, with him was that uh, he ended up committing suicide, I would find out later. Um, but that was the first time that I got in trouble when I was when I was nine years old. Um, and this sort of uh, behavior continued um, up until I was about 23, 24 years old. Um, and there was a lot of outside influences that were involved in my behavior, um, including um, alcohol, drugs, um, you know, the picking the wrong sort of friends to be with. Um, and so uh, that's, but yes, the first time it was when I was nine years old. So going back to that point, a little bit of it to understand the history or to understand the back um, story is essentially you know, maybe not having that sense of safety at home, father figure, parents, you didn't know your biological parents. So you feel like maybe that was kind of uh, acting out, obviously, because you couldn't answer that question. And maybe um, as time went on, you continued to just look for that kind of, some kind of solid background in maybe, you know, bad friends that you were having, but some sort of like gang or background that, you know, would give you something to support you? I feel that the reason why at such a young age I fell into this sort of rebellious attitude was simply displacement. I didn't know how to deal with my feelings, so I looked elsewhere to try to find where was it that I was able to fit in. And so for myself being young and not having an understanding, I found that I fit in with those, those peer groups of mine that that was similar that you know didn't have you know families that were really together um, you know fathers were in prison and you know mothers were you know maybe involved in some sort of prostitution um, you know I really honestly at that time felt these were the people that I was able to connect with because when we sat down and when we talked if they asked me where's your mom and your dad I could honestly answer them I don't know you know, and so for them having their story of, well, my father's in prison, my father's in jail, my father has drug issues, or my mother's doing this, my mother's involved in prostitution, she's, my mother's involved in drugs, you know, they were able to, at the same time, make a connection with me because to take it a step further, even though they knew that their parents had these issues, the fact was I never was able to even meet my parents. <clears throat> Pause for a second. Audio screening. Camera speed. Action. 
So without getting into too many details of your, your troubled past, but so people can understand you know, the kinds of things that you got into, tell us a little bit about how you moved around, where did you get, where did you live, what got you in, you know, what kind of situations did you find yourself in? Well, originally I was born in Bogota, Colombia. Um, I was adopted there. Um, I had a sister who was adopted about four years before I was. Um, and once my family adopted me, um, we moved um, to Sri Lanka. Um, from Sri Lanka, we moved to the United States. Um, so when I first was living in the United States, which was roughly around age four, I was living in um, Reston, Virginia. Um, the, I was raised in a middle class family. Um, and basically from the time I was four up until I was about 15 years old, I lived at my household, being that in, in, during that time I was in and out of trouble. Um, residential programs, juvenile detentions, rehabilitational centers. Um, so that, that sort of behavior carried on until I was 15 years old, um, at which point when I was 15, I got sent downstate um, I was committed, is the, is the term that they call committed downstate, which is basically a juvenile prison. Um, so once you, you continuously go to the juvenile um, system um, in Fairfax and they decide that you're either an habitual offender or you've committed a serious enough offense, they send you downstate, which is in Richmond. Um, so I was in Richmond for roughly three, three four months, and um, at which point in time my parents moved to Italy, to Rome, Italy. My father had a, a job offering there, um, and they moved to Italy. And um, because of my attitude and just my beliefs at that time, I didn't want to leave the United States. Yeah, I, 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 the United States was all that I knew. This is where all my friends were. This is where I knew how, I, you know, in the back of my mind, um, I knew that this is where the, the lifestyle um, of you know using drugs and alcohol and partying and women and all these things this all existed in, in the United States I knew nothing of a sort of another lifestyle that could support that sort of dream that was abroad so um, that that was up until I was uh, I went there and at which point I went to a boarding school because my parents had no other decision they had they 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 asked me to go with them to Italy, but I, I refused. I didn't want to go with them to Italy. So they sent me to a high school in Poland Spring, Maine. Um, so that was different because that was basically sent me out to the countryside, which I was never, I wasn't familiar with that sort of environment. Um, so I was there until I was 18. Um, actually, I was, there, I was there seven days before I turned 18, um, at which point I left the program. Um, and then that's when I moved to Florida. Um, and then Florida introduced me to a whole new lifestyle. So from 15 to 18 when you were in Maine, obviously the, the intent was to, you know, to save you or to get you out, get you out of your element maybe that you were too comfortable with here. Were you, um, did you have any like feelings of that same, you know, when your, your adoptive parents are now across the world, you're on your own. How did the whole experience there go? Well, I think I accepted the feeling of abandonment at a young age and being involved in uh, juvenile delinquency since the age of nine, there's a sort of feeling that you get when that first time or times after that, that you get put into that, to that holding cell, to that jail cell, and um, that door is shut behind you. You're in there by yourself. You know, there's, there's no one else around to talk to, to hear your thoughts. Um, so once my parents left to go to move to Italy, um, I, I really was, it didn't really shock me. By that time I had sort of, my feelings of abandonment were, they, they were just so strong that by that happening, it just sort of made me feel that, you know, this is my purpose. It, it, this isn't something that's new. I was born into this world by myself and I'll continue to live in this world by myself. So you had a pretty early, early because of all this going on, feeling of isolation and feeling of like, you know, you, you never really got used to even having your adoptive parents take care of you in a certain sense. I didn't know how to deal with authority because I felt nobody could tell me what to do. So then you moved to Florida at the age of 18 and get into, you know, tell us a little bit about how, how, how deep the lifestyle got. Mm. Walk us through a little bit about how deep you got into the game, so to speak. When I was in Florida, the, 
I had full intentions before I went down to Florida that I was going to go down to Florida and get involved with drugs and uh, making money off selling drugs um, and alcohol and um, you know being with with many different women and I, I had full intentions of getting involved in this sort of lifestyle so it was similar to um, a self-fulfilling prophecy that that my life led up to that point um, so when I was 18 I, I went down there and I ended up um, meeting um, somebody down there who um, introduced me to the to the whole drug game and um, teaching me about what it was to be a drug dealer and living a sort of lifestyle where you're constantly high you're constantly drunk um, you're constantly putting your life in danger um, I mean this this includes driving around in cars with with guns in on your possession um, running around being you know completely intoxicated um, completely high um, to to it's, it's just a point where literally you're you're insane you know um, so I mean what my mind at, at that point in time my mind decided that I was going to become a successful drug dealer you know that um, selling drugs was going to be the way that I was going to make a living for myself and this sort of living that I had um, planned for myself was going to be one that you know I was going to be living lavishly you know, I was going to have all the nice cars, and I was going to have the nice homes, and the nice jewelry, and the nice clothes, and um, I was going to be popular, you know, and um, people were going to fear me, you know. Um, so, as from this started when I was 18, um, and this carried on until I was about 23 years old, and um, little did I know that this lifestyle was going to take a turn for the worse, but that things were going to get serious, and um, it did. You know, you start talking about, you know, making more money. Now you're talking about dealing with people that are deeper into the game, people who are more serious about the game. You're talking about having to get, you know, protect yourself even further. Um, you know, this means that you have to protect yourself with guns. Um, and, um, you know, you have to do certain things that, um, that are dangerous, the very dangerous things. Um, at that time, um, my, my escape from, you know, dealing with this reality was the drugs and the alcohol. Once I was able to use um, drugs, whether it was cocaine or ecstasy, um, that sort of um, feeling of having to deal with reality and you know, your conscious coming into play and saying that this is wrong, it, it, it numbs that. Not only does it numb it, but it, it sort of, uh, it, it adulterates it and makes it, it you, you believe that you, know, you can get away with this. And you know, um, that you're sort of the, uh, you're, you're in this movie and uh, you're the star of this movie. And, um, you don't really think about the consequences, you're just thinking about the instant gratification because a lot of it comes with that sort of lifestyle. So you feel like that this, some of this is led up to with, you know, obviously we watch movies and TV shows and glamorizes the lifestyle and such. Do we feel like, you know, you were, like you said, you were kind of living a movie. You were kind of almost like preloaded to kind of like see this as a potential successful ending that you live on to your your senior years doing illegal drug dealing. Is that maybe because of some of the stuff you saw and the people you were around, it just became normal? I believe a lot of the reasons why inside my mind I believe that I was living this sort of lifestyle was because growing up I found such a fascination with what was coming off of the television and what was coming off of music and the things that were being spoken about. Um, you know, so when, when I hear about people speaking about selling drugs and living this sort of lavish lifestyle, it you know it it's appealing you know so um, you know you hear of you know somebody uh, you know bragging or boasting that they sell drugs and now they have these beautiful women for someone who's young and has they have no sense of direction um, it's it's possible which happened with me that you you believe that this is the direction that you want to go to or that you want to go towards um, so I mean just growing up and just being influenced by um, what was coming off of the television and things that were coming off of the music and the lyrics that are being spoken um, you know I believe that you know this was a path that was being paved um, sort of something like a, a, a sort of direction that was being given to me um, so this was it, it really audio speed camera speed Take it from the top of that last question because there's good stuff in there. Action. 
So as you were down in Florida from the age of 18 to 23, um, you were saying before that some of the, uh, the lifestyle was influenced by music and by, you know, lack of positivity and you're kind of on your own listening to this, you know, this idyllic lifestyle. Speak on that a little bit. When I was in Florida, my lifestyle became involved with simply becoming a drug dealer and um, falling into the, a pit of alcoholism and drug abuse. Um, and a, a lot of that led up to because of the sort of information that I was putting inside of my, um, inside of my head. Um, at a young age, I, you know, would listen to uh, music that, you know, glamorized the lifestyle of, uh, of selling drugs and um, glamorized the lifestyle of, uh, of using and abusing drugs and alcohol and um, using women, um, in, you know, in, in, in negative ways. Um, so if you sit there and you listen to that sort of uh, information being put inside your head for, um, you know, five, six, seven, eight years, um, in, in some way it... it paints a, a reality for you, you know, um, and, and for some, maybe not necessarily everybody, but for someone who has the intentions of, you know, they want to live a life where they're not following the rules and they're not being law abiding, um, it influences it. It influences their decisions and that's what it had done for me um, because it, it spoke of a lifestyle which I wanted to be able to attain. I wanted to be the person riding around, um, you know, that, that people looked at in awe and that, uh, that people um, you know, respected and feared and um, that had lots of money and had power. Um, I, I wanted to be that person because I heard of it being spoken about that, you know, living this sort of lifestyle, you can do that. Once you make it to the top, this is the way that people look at you. So you didn't maybe possibly have a long-term vision for much except for getting that. You didn't there was nothing positive that pulled you away from it, so that was the positivity in your life, even though it was negative. Yeah. That was a sense of becoming somebody that you could be. You know, that was the achievement of something where somebody else might go to college. You were like, I want to graduate and be a, be a drug kingpin. Since I was young, I never had the idea of wanting to be somebody who was successful um, and positive. Since I was young, I always had the mind frame that I wanted to grow up and be um, somebody who you know was involved in, in crime and um, made their made their living off of that um, because inside of my mind um, you know this this was the way to to gain power um, and this this was the way to make your to make this is the way that a person would feel happy um, you know by having you know multitude of women and um, you know all this access to drugs and alcohol and um, being under under the influence and with this sort of mind frame where you get to live life aimlessly and you know, you're just sort of floating on cloud nine high all the time and just acting like life isn't full of responsibilities when in reality life is full of responsibilities. Um, so at, at a young age I developed this negative identity of myself and it carried over until up until I was 23 years old when uh, to my final incarceration. So wrapping it up, I mean, you had a lot of drive, a lot of ambition, a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of positive men, uh, mental states, just for the wrong product, just for the wrong. You know, it's not to say that anyone's doing bad isn't ambitious. They're just ambitious, maybe for the wrong goals. Hmm. Can you speak to anybody that might be out there that might have this kind of idea that, you know, to realize that they have something good inside them, they're just chasing the wrong star. My advice would be for somebody who's out there in a life of alcoholism or using drugs or in some way making, um, making money from, um, from crime would be that it eventually is going to, it all comes out in the wash. You know, you're, you're living a lifestyle that eventually is going to catch up to you. And I understand that the lifestyle is hypnotizing and it, it, it's, it's fun at the time, but once and hopefully once your mind matures and you have the understanding that you're not, what you're doing isn't right, you you eventually figure out that you know you have to change your lifestyle, and um, I mean changing your lifestyle, um, it's about changing your mind frame. You have to find some sort of belief system. You have to believe. For me, I, I I had to I had to start believing in God, because I looked everywhere else for the answer except for God. 
So um, for me, by getting into spirituality, um, it made me realize that, you know, my purpose in life isn't to be living a life that's, you know, involves drugs and alcohol and, um, you know, living a life of criminality. Um, it's, it's not, you know, my, my purpose in life is to, to be truthful um, and to do what's right. Um, and so my, my advice for, for someone who's uh, living this sort of lifestyle is really think about what you're doing, you know, no matter what age it is that that person is. If you could be nine years old and you could just be um, beginning it, or you can be, um, you know, 35, 40 years old and, you know, been living it your whole lifestyle. You know, my, my story is simply that I was involved in that sort of mentality um, and that lifestyle. And um, only by the grace of God am I still here to be able to explain my story. Um, but there's people that, you know, that I associated with who are no longer here. Um, and once again, um, the reason for that, I, I don't really know. Why is it that people that I've associated with um, are, are no longer here? Um, all, I can simply, all I can simply do is just continue to take steps forward and um, let people know um, and, and just give them my advice that, you know, give, give up the lifestyle. It's, it's going to catch up to you and, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's something that's not worth it. So you spoke a little bit on your religion. You've obviously... Um, Can we stop here for a second? Sure. 